third Sunday in Easter. Uh, my name is Fiona Devoy and I was with you, if you were here on Easter Sunday, I was with you a fortnight ago. So it's lovely to be with you again this morning to be able to, to lead worship. I'm here with my husband David, who is lost sight of temporarily. <laughs> lost sight of temporarily. So we'll, we'll get a chance to speak to you hopefully after the service when it's uh, tea and coffee through the back. I've had a look at the biscuits, so they're quite nice this morning. So we're coming through, through for that later on. So, um, I hope you'll be blessed by being with us this morning, and I'd like to invite you just to take a moment to compose yourself before God, and then we'll stand and we'll say our call together. Please stand for our call to worship. Let us start this service well by reminding ourselves that it is not we who choose Christ, but Christ who chooses us. That we are not here because of our goodness, but because of Christ's grace. That we are not here to enlighten ourselves, but to allow Christ to enlighten us. That we have not come to be entertained but to worship the Lord with heart, soul, mind and strength. And I can invite you to do that now in our first song, Jesus is Lord, creation's voice proclaims it. Maybe that was many years ago, maybe it was much more recently. However, and whenever it came, 
We are all, each and every one, called by your voice to follow you. And yours is still the voice we hear today. As we listen to your spirit in your word, in the events of our lives and in the world around us, help us to become more attuned to your voice and your guidance in the way we walk every day. Lord, we come knowing that we are flawed and imperfect, like Peter in our Bible reading today. And we know that we so often fail to live up to our good intentions and your high ideals. But we also know that we are forgiven and our sins wiped clean by the sacrifice of the risen Christ, who shows us what you are like. And so we have hope for our fallen, imperfect lives and our fallen, imperfect world. Hope that one day all will be put right and our world will be made whole at the end of time. And while, Lord, we wait, we come to worship, knowing we are accepted and we are loved just as we are, beloved children of our loving God. And for this reason, we pray for the coming of your kingdom and for our role in this coming, using the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive Amen. us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So in a leading worship, I usually begin the service with either a children's talk or a few first thoughts on the theme of uh, the worship today. So I'll say a bit more about that as we go along. So I've got a question for you to start off. I like starting off with questions because it means at least I know you're awake at the beginning. So we've got our first slide up. Okay, put the next one up for me, Robert. Right, who, who's this? I don't know who this is. Mystic Meg. Mystic Meg, there we go. Somebody that's not too too uh, reluctant to shout out. Well done, Mystic Meg. Anybody know who Mystic Meg is? Or was? Oh my goodness, I'm I'm stumping you this morning. Well, Mystic Meg, she was the horoscope writer who began providing predictions on the National Lottery Show when the, the draw was first televised on Saturday nights. So she appeared every week in a wee slot called Mystic Meg Predicts, and it was a 45 second reading segment when she allegedly predicted facts about the future winner of the lottery. Yes, you know, she said things like, the winner will be a tall man with a limp and a moustache living in the Midlands, or a young woman wearing a red dress who's been disappointed in love living in London, you know. It's all a bit of fun trying to make you think that you were in with a chance of winning. And the National Lottery first began, MD you know when it first began, the National Lottery? It's a nice round number. Not 25 years ago. 30 years ago, 1994, 1994. So I think I'm right in saying that when the, the show first started, there was no mistake made. Instead, they had a numbers expert telling you how poor your chances were of winning the lottery. So if you go on a wee bit, a wee picture of him. I mean, I would never have known who this was. His name apparently is Sam Warren, but he didn't last very long because people didn't like to hear the statistics about how poor their chances were of winning, which is why they wanted to focus on Mystic Meg, you know, giving us hope that we had the possibility of actually winning the lottery. Is there anybody who's going to actually own up to buying a ticket? Put your hand up if you buy it. Good for you. We won't judge you. We won't judge you. you can put your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. You're not alone because there's millions of you every week. And here's the next question. And I'll get a surprise if anybody puts their hand up for us. Has anybody here ever won more than £10 on the lottery? Well, that's a relief. I thought maybe there was a millionaire living in a village or something like that. But most of us end up looking like this little chap in the next slide. We all end up looking a wee bit disappointed and despondent, you know. He's a wee bit young to have bought a lottery ticket because you've got to be 18 for that. 
But quite often, we feel like he looks. You know, we're a bit disappointed in life. Life is full of disappointment and full of discouragement, which is part of our theme today. So being disappointed and having our hopes dashed is all part of our human experience. You know, we all know what it's like when some event that we're pinning our hopes on doesn't happen. And I don't just mean putting your money on the horses or buying a lottery ticket. You know, something we desperate or something we desperately want passes us by and our hopes are dashed. We all know what that feels like, especially when it's something more important than whether we win the lottery or not. You know, has anybody here ever been disappointed in love? Put your hand up. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> You're all obviously very successful at wooing the opposite gender. <laughs> and you ever go into a job interview and not got the job? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and here ever have to sit their driving test more than once? Yes. <laughs> and his team lose on a Saturday afternoon? Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Team lost on a Saturday afternoon. Yes. So disappointment is all part of life. Yet yeah, life moves on and we survive it. So last week, if you were in church, Stephen was talking about the two disciples, Cleopas and his companion on the Emmaus Road. They were bitterly disappointed at the death of Jesus. And this week, we're going to hear about seven of the disciples fishing on the Sea of Galilee, wondering what is going to happen next. But one of them is especially feeling disappointed in himself and wondering if God is disappointed in him. And that's the disciple Peter who's carrying around a whole load of guilt and a deep sense of failure at his denial of Jesus at his arrest. You know, can Jesus ever forgive him? And does he have any place in the Lord's plans? You know, it's easy to become discouraged when we have been disappointed in our dreams. Disappointment is part of life, but also, thankfully, it's hope. And even though we have been disappointed in love, we don't usually swear off the opposite sex permanently, but eventually we find somebody who's just right for us. You know, if we fail in a job interview, we pick ourselves up and we apply for the next one that comes along and hopefully, eventually, we succeed and we find our niche in life. And if we fail our driving test, we hopefully keep going and try again and pass the next time, or the next time, or the next time, or the next time, or the next time in my case. You need to count how many times that is. So yes, we, we all we all survive a wee bit of disappointment. And who still buys a ticket for the lottery after not winning week after week? Yeah. Forty-five million people apparently every week do buy a lottery ticket. So that's a probably an example of hope triumphing over experience, although it's a fairly trivial one in the great scheme of things. So as Christians, if we look at our very last slide. We know where our real hope lies. You know, it lies in the one who offers us so much more than just a winning lottery ticket and euro millions and a life of ease. You know, what our Lord offers is, is something money can buy, which is much more amazing. And for this, we are deeply grateful every day. So I'd like to invite you to stand if you are able to sing our next song alleluia alleluia give thanks to the risen lord
reading today comes from the Gospel of John and it's the whole of the final chapter, chapter 21. And when you get a chance to look in your Bibles, you'll see that this chapter is often given the heading, an epilogue. And as you know, an epilogue is an additional section in a book to tie up some loose ends after the main story. And if you get a chance to read the last few verses in chapter 20, which looks like the final ending, we can see what that means. You know, in the final verses of chapter 20, Jesus has just appeared to the disciples in the upper room for the second time with poor old Thomas, the doubting disciple, when he finally gets a chance to meet the risen Christ and <coughs> to believe. And John seems to round off events there. But we're left with questions. You know, the question, so what now? The risen Lord has appeared to Mary Magdalene in the garden and twice to a group of disciples in the upper room. But what happens now? And Jesus' followers are in that strange time after the resurrection, but before the next best thing, wondering what happens next. So typically Peter gets fed up hanging about, waiting for things to happen, not quite knowing what to get up to. So he announces, I'm off fishing. And a bunch of the other disciples decide to tag along too. And when things are uncertain, it's comforting to do what they know so well. So off they go to do a spot of night fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And Jean is going to come and read her, her verses for us this morning. And she pointed out to me that the, the window there on your left is actually based on this story. So you can maybe have a look at that while she's, she's reading us in our Bible reading. Good morning. Good morning. The reading was taken from John chapter 21 verses 1 to 25, and this can be found on page 1090 of the Pew Bible. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus had appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, 
Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? This is a disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Amen. May the Lord bless this reading from his holy word. <coughs> Thank you, Jean. Can I invite you to sing again, Christ be beside me, and we'll stay seated for this one. <coughs> to see beyond what we might expect 
and to be changed by deeper insights. Amen. So if we get the first slide up, Robert, please, the next one. Okay, anybody ever been on one of these? Oh my goodness, you're very, a very unadventurous lot. Yeah. Have you ever been in one of these? Have you ever been in one of these at the back? No. No. Would you like to go in one of these? No. <laughs> well, I have to say I agree with you because even in my youth, even when I was young, I wouldn't have been tempted by going on a roller coaster like this. I mean, it makes me queasy just looking at it. But actually, these, these kind of rides are really popular. I mean, people queue up to get on them, maybe because of the adrenaline high that they get with it, you know, but it's definitely something you wouldn't want to do right after your lunch, you know? <laughs> but although many of us would never actually go on a roller coaster in real life, we all know what it means when people talk about life being a bit of a roller coaster of emotions. You know, they use this kind of image to express how topsy turvy their recent experiences have been. Oh, you know, it's a real roller coaster of emotion, real ups and downs. You know, and sometimes the ups are good and sometimes the downs are bad and sometimes they'll be around. And if there had been a roller coaster in the disciples' time, that would probably how they would have described their time with Jesus. You know, because the last three years have been full of highs and they've been full of lows. Before they met Jesus, they were obviously looking for something. They might have been a bit discontented with their lives, you know, looking for something else, something more. And then they got the call to follow, the call to leave behind the familiar for something uncertain, but that they would hoped would be better, something full of promise. So there was the excitement and the buzz of something new, of having their old ways of thinking overturned by unexpected ideas and the witness of amazing ideas, you know, and amazing deeds, amazing things. And there was also the buzz of being in the inner circle of the great man Jesus, whom everybody wanted to meet. But there was also the underside, the hint of danger and the confusion and the doubt of things they didn't quite understand. But there was the hope and the expectation that something big was going to happen when they went up to Jerusalem for the Passover feast in this third year. You know, things were coming to a head, surely. But then came bitter, bitter disappointment and a sense of failure with the arrest and the death of Jesus and whom they had placed all their hopes. But when they were still fresh in their grief, they heard rumours of something truly unbelievable, of Jesus coming back from the dead. I mean, what would you make of that? You know, was it just hysterical thinking by women who wanted to think that this had happened? But then the disciples are together and see Jesus with their own eyes in the upper room, where they were hiding in secrecy and in fear. And he seemed to be real, he seemed not to be a ghost. You know, you might have thought, maybe you're seeing things. But they got to see the wounds in his hands and in his side, and they got to feel his breath on their skin. And they were overjoyed and excited and hopeful that the story hadn't reached its conclusion yet. You know, there was more to come. But then Jesus disappears again. So what happens next? And they're still hiding from, from the world when Jesus appears again for a second time. And this time he eats food in front of them and he tells them to stop doubting and believe. And then he leaves again. So what next? And as we know, it's Peter, who's always a leader, who decides to go back to a familiar place, a familiar place of comfort, his fishing boat. And maybe he wants just the joy of the open air and the open water and the simplicity of physical action rather than the complications of new ideas and the emotional demands of the last few weeks. You know, we've got a wee slide of Peter, obviously. If you go back one. Yeah, there he goes. Not, not an original photograph, obviously, but this is the actor who plays Peter in the TV series The Chosen. Have any of you been watching that? The Chosen on telly? No. Peter is probably the most impetuous one of the group. He's an emotional man who feels things very deeply and he acts upon his feelings. And with Peter, what you see is what you get. 
You know, so the disciples all go off fishing. Um, we know about the stranger on the shore who calls out with advice to them in their little boat, like one that we saw on the slide, a boat that would have been quite close to shore, quite, quite a, a narrow boat. And since their fishing has been unsuccessful and it's been a failure, they do as he says because they've got nothing to lose and they catch a whole pile of fish. Uh, we all know this part of the story very well. And I'd like to jump ahead to the conversation that Jesus and Peter have after the barbecue on the beach. And they have, after the joy of discovering that Jesus really was alive and not dead, Peter must have had a whole range of complicated feelings to deal with. After all, the disciples had all run away when he was, Jesus was arrested, except for John, who was brave enough to accompany the woman to the foot of the cross and at least be with Jesus in his last sufferings. So I imagine Peter would have been delighted and relieved and excited at Jesus' resurrection, but he might also have been filled with and overwhelmed with shame and remorse at what he had done, at his cowardice. You know, not only had he run away, he had denied he even knew Jesus, not just once, but three times. And Jesus had warned him. That that's what was going to happen, he said to him. But he just didn't believe him. He just said, no, no, that, that can't happen. That will never happen. So he must have had a real sense of failure and guilt and no expectation that Jesus would ever trust him again. Yes, Jesus had, had appeared to the group of disciples and yes, he had offered them all peace. But Peter hadn't a chance to sit down and talk to him and clear the air between them until now. So there's unfinished business between Peter and his Lord. So you can imagine the scene on the beach uh, in the early morning. The disciples have finished eating and they've broken into small groups after their meal. And Peter and Jesus have probably moved away from the rest of them to be able to speak in private. And I think Peter must have been really, really startled when Jesus asked him, he started off by, by asking if he loved him. Simon, son of John, Jesus says, do you love me more than these? And we're not quite sure what the these are that Jesus is referring to. We're not sure he's pointing to the other disciples and means, so do you love me more than all the other disciples love me? Or maybe it means, do you love me more than you love anyone else in the world? Or maybe he means, do you love me more than fishing or family or anything else in the world that you value? We're not quite sure exactly what that refers to, but we know that he is asking how deeply Peter cares for his Lord and how deep his commitment is to him now. And I think if it had been me or you in Jesus' shoes meeting a dear friend who had let us down so badly, we would have started off with, you know, how could you? How could you go off and abandon me to my fate? You know, everybody else can understand them, but you, you know, I expected better. And I think we would have felt justified in taking time to express how hurt we were at the way our friend had abandoned us in our hour of need. But there's no anger and there's no reproach. You know, Peter knew he had let Jesus down. You know, perhaps if he had stayed at his side rather than running away, the rest of the disciples would also have stayed, you know, to be arrested and executed as well. So he probably expected to be blamed and chastised. But instead, he experiences only love and grace and Jesus' faith that he can still be entrusted with tasks, the tasks of looking after others and spreading the gospel. Jesus doesn't say, oh, you've let yourself down. I don't need that kind of disciple. But he says, follow me. And Jesus is doing exactly what he taught in the parable of the prodigal son that we all love so much. You know, that beautiful story all about forgiveness and grace and unconditional love. And then after this, at the end of this conversation, there's a strange wee bit that comes next where Jesus, where, where Peter sees the disciple who Jesus loved tagging along behind them. And Jesus has just made a remark about Peter's eventual fate, which the narrator tells us is a prediction of Peter's eventual martyrdom for his faith. And then Peter turns and he sees John and he points to him and he says to Jesus, you know, well, that's going to be my fate. You know, what about him? You know, what's going to happen to him? 
And there's probably a bit of a story behind that, you know, maybe a bit of jealousy and rivalry going on there, competition for Jesus' affections and esteem between Peter and John. But Jesus says, in effect, never you mind about him. His faith doesn't concern you. You know, we don't need to be envious of others and their place in the kingdom. We all have different roles to play and different tasks to complete. And we know that people who give up their lives for their faith are to be honoured and admired and prayed for, but we are not all given that task to do. You know, I get really depressed at those sermons that preach that this is the, the great Christian ideal, laying down one's life for one's friends. And I doubt at my stage in life that I'll ever be expected to sacrifice my life for others. You know, uh, it's not very helpful to hold that up as an ideal form of service. But we remember and we honour those whose lot in life it is to do this. But it's not my call and it's probably not your call. Peter was called to preach the gospel in dangerous times and to be put to death for it. But John had a different role to play, to teach others and to write his kingdom, his, his gospel down for, for later generations to read. You know, that was his part in the kingdom of God. So let's not be disappointed at our role to live out our Christian faith in the small tasks of life in our daily struggle. You know, we're only responsible for our own response to following Jesus, not anyone else's. So how do we feel about God today? in our daily walk with him. Perhaps we feel disappointed in God because our life has not turned out as we wanted it to be. Perhaps we fall into the trap of thinking that blessings are signs of God's approval and that difficulties are somehow our own fault in some way, something we deserve. Or maybe you just despair of the effort you put into your discipleship and into the church but feel you are failing because the people around have no time for God. You know, I think there's a lot of that at the moment with buildings closing and church families being broken up, as you have experienced yourself. And maybe you feel that God loves everyone else, just not you. And I tend, I know that I tend to fall into this way of thinking when I'm tired and when I'm discouraged and I look around and I see what good things other people have and I don't. But we can see from the story of Peter and Jesus that God always looks on us with love. God is not a parent who is disappointed in us like naughty children. He knows that we will fail, you know, and, and we do at times fail. He knows that we will let him down and we do let him down at times, but he still calls us to follow. He knows that's what we are like, yet he chose us and he calls us to follow him still. So as we wait for the fullness of resurrection at the end of time, let's look for the little daily resurrections in our lives. The times when we despair, yet we're given hope, and when we fail and we pick ourselves up to try again. And let's look for the glimpses of God in everyday things. So I'll leave you with the final slide and the question, you know, when we, when we sit in the presence of God before him, how do we believe the Lord sees us? You know, what does he see? Does he see someone who doesn't come up to the mark, someone who fails constantly and isn't worth the effort of bothering with? Or does he see someone that he loves and he cares for very much, very deeply? Does he, do we, does he see someone worth dying for? So let's just pause for a moment and let that thought rest. Amen. <laughs> Our next song is one of my favourite ones. Uh, I did ask Jenny if you knew it because it can be a wee bit tricky to pick up, but she, she assures me you'll sing it beautifully, so I've got high expectations. So I can invite you to stand and, and sing this song if you're able and to stay standing at the end for our, our dedication.
accept the fruit of our labour, which we bring to you today as a result of our toils and the struggles of life. Guide us as we re rededicate ourselves to your service, as we pass on the love you have shown to us in Jesus to others. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Elizabeth is going to come and read the notices and also lead us in our prayers for the church and the world. Just two notices this week. Um, our weekly calendar, as per every week, um, there's a lot happening. It's quite a full week, so uh, have a look, a look up there and. Uh, value all of that. It's a lot of work goes into all these things and um, it's a real blessing to be able to to attend and worship together. So come along to anything that you're able. And then next, Frank Stark's funeral arrangements. Frank's funeral will be on Friday the 19th. That's Friday coming. Two o'clock at East Calder Church and then three o'clock at Livingston Crematorium. And so let us pray together. Father God, having just mentioned lots of activities in our church life, we pray that you would help us never to take an active church life where fellowship is valued for granted. We thank you that church is not a building or just a Sunday service, but it is who we are and our relationship with you and our care for our brothers and sisters in you. We thank you that our church life is full and that it provides many opportunities for fellowship and worship. 
We pray your leading and guiding of all activities, of all who attend and of all who lead. May your will be done and your guiding at the centre of all that is done in your name. We pray for Darren, Lord, in his role as interim moderator. We pray his holiday was a blessing to him and his family, and that there was plenty rest and time to lay aside his many responsibilities that he carries. Guide him as he picks those up again, and may your will be done in and through him as he seeks to serve you. We thank you for Fiona leading us in our worship today, and we thank you for her servant heart and willingness to share in her faith journey during the vacancy. We thank you that there are no strangers in your house, but friends still to get to know each other better. God, we pray your blessing upon Fiona and David in their home life and work life as they live their faith. Loving Father, we lift again this week the family of Frank Stark. We thank you for the years of dedicated service Frank gave to your church here and for the warm smile and kind word he had for all. Father, we pray for the family as they attend the funeral on Friday and ask that this would be a day of great comfort. Bless Brenda as she leads it and may there be a great feeling of relief that Frank's race is won, that his suffering is over and that he is at peace. May they know themselves held by you in their grief. We pray for all our church family and community who are unwell just now. We thank you that you know all the struggles, those seen to others and those only known deep in individual hearts. We pray your strength, your grace, your healing and your comfort for all who cry out to you in their need. Your world is crying out, God with war-torn places, famine, drought, flooding, injustice, poverty. God of the poor, friend of the weak, give us compassion, we pray. Father, keep us faithful in prayer. Show us how we can help. And may we all do our bit. Father, we pray for ourselves. We pray you would give us wisdom and discernment for all you call us to. We pray you would equip us to carry out your will and help us to keep seeking and serving. May we always put on your armour and live our faith in a way that is led by and pleasing to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I was really touched to be prayed for in the prayers. I don't think that's ever happened to me before. So thank you very much for that. Uh, our closing hymn is, Will Your Anchor Hold in the Storms of Life? So you, if you're XBB, you'll love this one. I invite you to stand and sing with me.
Let's bow our heads for God's blessing. Lord God, as we sail on the waters of life, with all its calms and storms, you are the resting place of our restless hearts. You are our life's companion, our friend and our refuge. And so we ask for your blessing today. May the love of the Father, the tenderness of the Son, and the presence of the Spirit gladden our hearts and bring peace to our souls this day and all days. Amen.